How many of you say it does your heart good to see kids on the of God? Yeah. It's the only hope our nation has is to see young people doing the works of Jesus. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 11, we want to start at verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and you have begun to reign. We've been doing a series on eliminating fear from our lives. And last week, if you were here, you remember that we talked about developing an awareness of the presence of God. It's impossible to be aware of the presence of God and live in fear because Psalm 93 says that God's enemies fall in his presence. Say, God's enemies fall God's in his presence. Fall. The psalmist wrote, when my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish at your presence. And so one of the ways that you eliminate fear, you realize eliminating fear is not optional to the Christian. Jesus Christ said, let not your heart be troubled. Hmm. And it's like I said before, if I tell a two-year-old, you get that pitcher from off the fridge for me and bring it to me. That's really unfair, isn't it? Because that two-year-old can't reach it. Now listen, either Jesus Christ was unfair when he said, let not your heart be troubled, or he knows, I don't believe he's unfair, do you? Yeah. And when he said, let not your heart be troubled, that means it has to be possible for us to live without a troubled heart in a crazy society. So last week we talked about the fact that developing the awareness of the presence of God will allow us to live free of fear. In Exodus 23, 20, and 22, we didn't read this last week, but I love this verse so much since we missed it, I thought we'd go back. The Lord told the children of Israel, excuse me, Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. And verse 22 said, If you will listen to his voice, if you will truly obey his voice and do all that I say, now look what the Lord says. He says, I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Now, if that doesn't make you smile, yeah. the only condition is that you're submitted to God, walking with God, loving God. He said, if you'll live there, any enemy that takes you on becomes my enemy. Glory to God. So that's a quick review of last week's, week's lesson. Today we want to discuss another reason that we can overcome fear and all fear, and that is simply because we have become heirs to a kingdom where fear simply does not exist. Yeah. In light of the news this week, it's almost hard to imagine a kingdom where fear doesn't even exist. And in that is awful society. It has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Now, this is something that has already begun, is a great shaking Shaking that is t um, talked about in Hebrews chapter 12, where this world, the, the kingdoms of this world, the systems of this world are going to fail. They're going to crumble and fall. The history of the world can be summarized in a couple of sentences. Man betrayed the one who gave him life, liberty, and a reason to live. And he turned his authority on this earth over to the ultimate rebel, the devil. The Bible says that Satan became the god of this world. I know some of you are familiar with this, but I'd just like to lay a basic groundwork so we're all on the same page. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 says that uh, the minds of the, of the unbelieving are blinded. It says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled in those who are perishing. In whose case, the god of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. So that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So who is called the God of this world? Satan. Satan. Yes. How did he get in? It's very simple. God said, have dominion. And Adam took that dominion given to him from God and handed it right over to the devil when he betrayed the one who had created him. But thank God, thank God. we're doing the whole history of man in three minutes here, so hang on. <laughs> thank God the last Adam came and redeemed mankind from this curse. And this last Adam came announcing the arrival of another kingdom. The very kingdom of God that had been kicked out of this world through rebellion was brought back through Jesus. Look, in Matthew 24, 13 to 14, we're going to look at a lot of scripture. Jesus said this, the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. 
Next verse. This good news, the gospel of the kingdom, is the kingdom good news? Are you aware of the fact that you can live and operate and function today in a totally separate kingdom from this world? We live here, but we're in another kingdom now. This good news of the kingdom shall be preached into the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. What? This is a little aside here. Did you know that we not only enter the kingdom, we receive the kingdom? Let's suppose it's 400 years ago and France still has Louis the whatever on the throne. This is still a kingdom. And I say, I entered the king of France last night. Well, that's interesting. He walked through the laundry. But what if I say, I received the kingdom of France? That means I inherited it. To receive a kingdom. Okay. Could, you, could we all go to Hebrews 12.28? It's totally out of order. But uh, Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Read this with me. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. Now, I grew up in a church where we were told we could be saved. Thank God that God is saved. And I understood, at least to some degree, I think in my little mind, the way I understood it, Someday, when we got to heaven, we would enter the kingdom. And then after a while, it finally became real to me that we already had entered the kingdom. How many of you were the fact you have entered the kingdom of God? But this doesn't say we've entered France. It doesn't say I entered the kingdom of France. No, it says we received the kingdom. Yeah. Whoever received the kingdom had to be born in the royal family and inherit it. Yeah. Yeah. And you say, why is this such good news? Because we're not just, you know, feeling our way groping through the kingdom of light. We are using authority, okay? Let's look at Mark chapter 1 and see how Jesus' life and ministry was characterized by the arrival of the kingdom. Mark 1, 14. We're going to see here that when Jesus came, his ministry jarred the people of Israel because it wasn't a religion. Now listen to this statement very carefully. His ministry changed their day-to-day -day reality. Say that with me. Jesus' ministry Jesus. changed Jesus. their day-to-day -day reality. Okay, Mark 1, verse 14. Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, if you remember, John preached the same thing. He, he preached, and some of you, I know this is just review, but John preached the arrival of the kingdom. When he showed up on the scene about six months before Jesus' ministry started, he said, repent. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what does that mean? If you're making a craft and you've got hot glue and you want to slap it all together on the base at once, the person who's teaching the class saying, now, have these things at hand before you get your glue pot. What does it mean? To have the things at hand, and then you can grab it. Yeah. John said, "The kingdom's at hand. The kingdom is so close. In the span of eternity, being born again was about three years away, three and a half years until Jesus was going to go to the cross. So the kingdom was at hand. It was so close that they could reach out and grasp it. When Jesus preached, he said, "The time is fulfilled." In verse 15, the kingdom of God is at hand. Now let's look down at verse 21. They went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. And they were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now what does that mean? The scribes taught, but their teaching had zero power to change their everyday lives. See, what we're talking about today is not a good religious theory, and it's not just good doctrine. The, the kingdom of God is to become manifest in our lives so that people, I mean, I'm a news junkie, and I try to keep the news off, but I saw a lot of news this week. And everybody was saying, but what's the solution? But what's the answer? Is God control the answer? How do we stop this? Well, listen, there aren't any answers aside from the change in man's heart. There are no answers aside from the kingdom of God. And that's why it's time for the Christian community to stand up and exemplify and live out the kingdom of God on earth to where we can say there is a viable alternative and that is God's ruling right here on earth. Jesus yeah. came. Yeah. Hallelujah. So verse 22, it says they were amazed at his teaching because he acted like he had authority. He did have authority. Verse 23. 
Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have to do with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. Everybody say authority. authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Jesus' teaching was marked by authority from another realm. The religious teaching of the day was led by a complete lack of authority over <coughs> the harmful power of the devil. Our lives, if we exemplify the kingdom of God on earth, should be characterized by authority. The Bible says in Romans, you say, where am I supposed to use my authority? Well, you use it when the devil pops his ugly head up, whether it's in your health or your finances or, you know, kids going the wrong way. I've got quiet in there. I mean, I'm afraid of the devil, are you? <coughs> if, if you are, get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Get born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you get baptized in one greater than you. The Holy Spirit of the living God has never no one minute of fear towards him. It's unthinkable, okay? Our minds are to be characterized as being backed by a superior kingdom. Now, let's go right on in the same chapter. Everywhere you look, you saw the arrival of the kingdom, Mark 1, 32 to 34. When evening came, after the sun set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city gathered at the door, and he healed many who were ill with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he was not permitting that the demons to speak because they knew who he was. So again, we see the same authority. Now I'd like you very quickly to go to Luke 11 because Jesus says in this passage that if you have seen authority over the enemy, you, the king, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Mm, I think I'm losing you. Last week we talked about this. We said... If the Lord Jesus Christ walked in at this moment in all of his glory, in the flesh, in all his glory, and someone came down and knelt down and worshipped him, I want to know something. Would you think that was unblind and ridiculous? No. no. Why? Because he died for us and we adore him. Let's suppose that he's not here in the flesh. And someone as we worship just comes down and kneels down and worships on their knees. A lot of people would say, What's up with that? A little over the top here, huh? Mm. Now, stop and think with me. Why did you say that if you didn't? Because you don't really believe he's here. Yeah. Now, I'm trying to help you bridge a gap here. Yeah. If you really believe he's here, and, I, and you see me and Neil, I have been doing it today, I've done it on occasion, but I find out down to worship. Anything. Eh, she's probably just putting on a show. It might be that I just really believe he's here. Yeah. Now, we tried to fill the gap last week. Your fearlessness in the kingdom will come when Christ in me, the hope of glory, is no longer good doctrine or just a good theory or pretty words, but living reality. When it becomes absolutely certain in you that he who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord, then... Okay. <laughs> I'm not afraid of you right now just because I'm more afraid of him. Amen. Okay, why are you afraid of him? Okay, because Jesus said fear him. If, okay, Psalm 19 says the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. If you embrace that one holy reverential fear, do you understand that when you stand before him, you will fear him more than you do at this moment? Don't get mad at me. I will fear him more. You know why? Because it is impossible for us in our little finite mind, in our little understanding, to comprehend his majesty. You, you know, you can do a few things to help you a little bit. You can study astronomy and, and just the massiveness, the utter massiveness of light years. I can't comprehend one light year. I doubt you can. Maybe you can. I can. 186,000 miles a second, light goes, and then you've got the minute, and then you've got the hour. How far does it go in an entire year? And they're talking about hundreds of thousands of light years. And you think you can get your mind around God? Look at me in the eye tell me you've got your... No. And he's, and, and he's like, what does that just mean? It just means that there'll be a day that with unveiled face, you will see your father face to face. And then you'll, you'll just say, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I would have served you more. I would have honored you more. What more 
Are you following this? I'm not just making this up. This isn't real just for you. It's real for me. It's for all of us. But what we can do is do our very, very best to know who he is and walk in his anointing now. Are we following? So that was last week's lesson. But what we're looking at today is the fact that you can walk in your kingdom authority, understanding that you are a child of the living God, in absolute fearlessness at all times. Look at what Jesus said in Luke 11. And we'll start at verse 15. Some of them said, he cast out demons by the Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Aren't you glad you didn't say that and have to explain to God why you said that? Yeah. Verse 17. But he, Jesus, knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. Verse 9, or look at verse 20. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, I love that. Do you know why? If there's a, the nasty demon you know, God doesn't have to use his whole hand to brush him off. A little finger will do, any pinky will do. How can we be afraid of the devil? Amen? Amen. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Wow. This means that the same kingdom that got booted out of the Garden of Eden when they rebelled is back in your midst. And now we've got a conflict of kingdoms. God desires for us to understand that the kingdom of God is in our midst. Now, Luke, Luke 17, 20 to 21, he said the same thing. It was so hard not to think about this this week. Let's look, let's look at Luke 17 and then we'll talk about headlines. You know, since we don't have Luke 17, we'll talk about headlines first. Um, have you ever heard the phrase sunum bonum? Anybody know what sunum bonum means? My, my father used to use it a lot. Okay, let's read this, then we'll talk about that. Jesus said, if I, oh, do you have Luke 17? Anyhow, yeah, Luke 17, we want to read 20 and 21. He says, the kingdom of God is within you. He said, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, oh, it's over there. It's in Saudi Arabia. It's in Timbuktu. No, he said, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now, I've said this before, but for those of you who haven't been around, the kingdom of God has two comings, just as Jesus had two comings. Jesus Christ's first coming was quiet, unobtrusive, and only a very few spiritual people in the know knew that he came, Right? Joseph knew, Mary knew, Zacharias and Elizabeth knew, the shepherds knew because they called that it was quiet, right? The second time when he comes, you won't have to guess whether he's come. Though. Every eye will see him. Yeah. Those that pierced him will mourn over him. Amen? Amen? So there's two comings. There's two comings of the kingdom. You have to understand that. When Jesus comes the second time, he brings his kingdom to earth. The whole world will know it and every knee will bow. But what he's talking about here is the kingdom that is extended to your heart the day that you were born again. Okay? Now, I'm going to talk to you about the clash of kingdoms that, that is all around us. I mean, it's obvious. I know you've seen it. Sunum bonum is a Latin phrase that means the highest good that there is. Hmm. My father, even when he wasn't that close to God, as a pastor used to say, you can always tell who a man is by what his sunum bonum is. Sunum bonum. Sunum means highest. Bonum means good. Latin means your highest good. We live in a society, listen carefully, where entertainment has become the sunum bonum, even in the church, to a high degree. Where the best part of your life, now don't get mad at me, I'm just going to meddle in you. I'm going to. Hey, we saw Idols Fall. The TV producer of the movie said, That's my home. Well, you know, if you as a Christian say, that theater is my home, you've got a problem because the presence of God is our home. Amen. The presence of God in this life and in the next is our sunum bonum. When you get to heaven, you know, there will be many, many delights from the streets of gold to the river. But there will be delights everywhere. Angels said, it will be lovely. Amen. But the sunum bonum will be looking into the eyes of Jesus. Amen. The sunum bonum will be to look at the face of the one who sits on the throne and say, Father, I can hardly imagine that you wanted me as your daughter, but I'm for all eternity, thank you. And then you go and you live a while, and then you go dash it back to the throne, and you say, 
Thank you. And that is the highest good of heaven. How many of you believe that in heaven there will be many goods, but the highest good of heaven will not be seeing your relatives that you miss. It'll be seeing Jesus. Amen. Now, having pastored a church for about 11 years, I know one thing. For some people, entertainment becomes the highlight of their month. They think, I don't get mad at you. I'm just trying to look at what happened here. We saw idols fall. Because I don't care how much you love Batman, you cannot call on Batman to save you. Because that is not really reality. That is a piece of celluloid or whatever it is that they put a movie on today. And there's coming a day when systematically we will see idols fall. Financial systems, entertainment. To where, and you say, oh, that's scary. Yeah, but the reason he's allowing idols to fall is so that people realize they're serving yeah. idols. Yeah. And at that time, the church of Jesus Christ had better know, we have the summum bonum. We have the real deal. Where we have a place where you can come and run and hide. Yeah. Hallelujah. Jesus proclaimed the good news of the kingdom everywhere he went. In Matthew 4, 23, it says he taught in their, in their villages and he preached the good news of the kingdom. He said that casting out, look at what he said. Jesus was going throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Healing and the good news of the kingdom always go together. Some of these things, some of you have heard me say before, but I don't know how to tell, I don't have a better illustration for those that are new. I was in a bad book, New York City, very high society, just trying to mind my P's and Q's. The next person next to me says, I am the king of Lysipatania. And I said, oh, my, my, uh, my drug is really bad. You'll have to help me where it is. Oh, he said it doesn't really exist, but I am the king. You know what I mean? Yeah, right, you're the king of nothing. <laughs> now listen, Christians have not announced to the world the fact that there is an imminent kingdom at hand. It is far more real than anything in a Batman movie or any other movie you've ever seen. This is the coming of a kingdom that will wipe out every other kingdom, it says in the book of Daniel. There was a rock made without hands, and it wiped out every human system and filled the whole earth. And you say, what's the point? Because how can they respect our king when they do not understand his kingdom? And it's time for us as believers to begin to talk about the kingdom of God, to be living representatives of the kingdom, and to live in, and to walk it out, to have the authority of the kingdom. That people can see that he's backing us. John 3, 3, Jesus told Nicodemus, you will not see the kingdom unless you're born again. He talked about the kingdom constantly. You, Jesus answered Nicodemus and said to him, truly I say to you, unless you are born again, or it can also be translated, born from above, you won't see the kingdom of God. So how do we see the kingdom? By being born again. Now listen, the moment we do that, I flip back to my elementary days in the evangelical church and I think, oh good, when I die, I'll see the kingdom of God. That's true. When I, when you, if you die at this moment and you're born again, you would be in glory. And that's wonderful. But we are to see the kingdom of God now. Jesus said, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom is in your midst. Mark 15, 42 to 43. Do you remember how Joseph of Arimathea was a Pharisee who took up the courage to get Jesus' body? When evening had come, already come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council. Why was he so interesting and special? Who himself was waiting the kingdom of God. You see, we are in the kingdom, and we're waiting for the kingdom. There's an awful lot of Christians who do not understand pouring your entire life into the kingdom of God. They don't understand pouring your finances and your prayer and your life. Now, these kids are on fire for God. You know what I mean? But what you were doing in Baltimore was advancing God's kingdom, Amen. the understanding. Amen. Okay? Our primary reason as Christians to continue to live in the fear of the Lord after we're saved. Oh, excuse me. Our primary to live, reason to be here is to advance the kingdom, but the reason Christians live in fear, I've known Christians who lived in a whole bunch of fear. And I feel this fear, fear that they won't have enough money. Fear. Mm -hmm. Primary reason, we don't understand we're part of the kingdom. If you understand that your father is king of the universe and that you are here on his business, if you were in France and you would receive the kingdom of France, okay, we better keep going to these scriptures that show that. <laughs> 
Did you know it's possible to be aware of the fact that you are here on, King's, on the king's business and that he's behind you and he's responsible for you and it's his problem? I mean, yeah. that's a very good place to be yeah. when you're so much in tune with his purposes that it's his purpose. Okay, look at Acts chapter 1. Do you know what Jesus talked to the disciples? Do you know that from the time he was raised till he ascended, there were 40 days? Amen? What did he talk to his disciples about in these precious 40 days? It's in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Luke says, the first account I composed the author list about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders. Oh my goodness, he did what? Does Jesus make suggestions or give orders? Whew, that's news to the church in America, isn't it? Everybody say, Jesus gives orders. After he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. The apostles were the ones who learned to take orders. Verse 3. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering, watch this, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days. Would this be important, this period of 40 days? Now they're born again and they're brothers and sisters. What are you talking about? <coughs> Speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. You know what he told them in John 16? He says, I've got a lot of things I want to say to you, but you can't bear them now. You say, why? Let's think of this. Nobody could get born again and transferred into the kingdom. You know, it, Colossians 1.13 says he delivered us from the authority of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of God. Nobody could experience that unless they could be born again and it was after, okay? What if you go to the boardwalk this afternoon and right off the bat you just start talking to people about the kingdom of God? They're going to think you're nuts. Now listen, do you know why? Because there's no way in the world to know the realm of the kingdom until you've been there. Um, Colossians 1.13 says that we've been delivered out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, what is the point? He couldn't talk to them about the things of the kingdom of God in detail until they were born again. Okay? When, the, when Paul had his final years of life, if you look at the last two verses of Acts chapter 28, it says that he was under house arrest, but he talked to people about the things of the kingdom. Do you have Acts 28, 30, 31? It says, he stayed two full years in his own ready quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God. When was the last time you were in a service and just heard a whole, whole, whole sermon about the kingdom? And the reason is that we, we think we want to put it all off to heaven when Jesus said, the time is now. Did you know? Now, we brought all this. Give me ten more minutes. We did all this to come to one verse. Let's go to Luke chapter 12. Jesus said, don't be afraid, little flock. The Father has chosen God like to give you the kingdom. And we said, it just blows over our head. Isn't that pretty? I like that. Let's put it on the wall and crochet it or for a uh, needle point. No, no, no. He's chosen to give you the kingdom of France. When you stepped in, you didn't enter France, you received the kingdom. Mm. Just think about this. Luke 12, 29. <laughs> Do not seek what you eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. Okay, what do most Americans spend 80 to 90% of their time worried about? Mm -hmm. Many, right? Yeah. Okay. Is financial provision the most important thing on most people's minds? Yeah. No, we don't want to admit it, but I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. He said, don't worry about it. Verse 20, or verse 30. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows you need these things, but what are we to do? Seek his kingdom. You say, Pastor, I could care less about his kingdom. Well. No, I'm not saying you're saying that, but think of that. It's not real to you. Because when the kingdom of God becomes real to you, the most important thing in the world is to see one more, one more heart added. To see it extended one more time, heart at a time. Amen? Yeah. It says, seek his kingdom. And these things will be added. Now look at verse 32. It's supposed to be our text for the whole day. Do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has chosen gladly to let you into the kingdom. No. You didn't enter, friends. You received, friends. You entered in. You, the father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. When you walk here. And you understand Jesus Christ is right next to the father. The father's on the throne and then there's Jesus. He's, we got that clear. But the Bible says over and over. Could you pull up Romans 8, 17? We've got three, three, three translations. It says we are joint heirs, co-heirs, fellow heirs. 
and you say, this means absolutely nothing to me. If the devil faces you this week, it means something to you. If, yeah. Read this with me from the King, the King James. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed you suffer with him, that we may be glorified now. What does it mean to be a joint heir? Okay, these are my two kids, if you're visiting. Those two kids right there. I have a will. And if I were to go home tomorrow, everything that I have would be divided exactly equally between the two of them. That means they're joint heirs. Other translations that we have here say co-heirs, fellow heirs, joint heirs. All mean exactly the same thing, share and share alike. Now, who are you joint heirs with? Okay, I see them. We just, you know where we went? We went from, oh, yeah, bad to pretty words. No, pretty words. Isn't that a cute doctrine? Fine doctrine. Joint, no. Okay, how many of you believe that these kids are my co heirs? Yeah. Yeah. Are they my joint heirs? Yes. Fellow heirs? Yes. What does it mean? Say, share and share alike. I wouldn't have that much to leave them, but anything I had, they divvy it up equally. Now, look at what it says. Anything that Christ inherits, we divvy up equally with him. Now, and you say, what does that mean? It means that everything you need in this life is provided. It means that there is authority. Okay, let me wrap this up. The Father is saying that every good thing that I've bestowed on the Son of my love is yours. Everything Jesus has inherited, he co-inherits with you. He said, I've chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. When you learn that, that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, then you do not, anything the Father assigns you to do, the finances are not your problem. Obedience is your problem. The authority to do it is not your problem. Speaking the name of Jesus. Think of what he's given us. In Philippians 2, 9, verse 9, 2 verse 9, it says that he's given Jesus the name above every name. Is that true? Yeah. And Jesus said, go therefore in my name. He said, in John 14, 13. Look at here, it says, For this reason God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name. We so take that for granted. If a devil spits in your face this week and says, Have you ever seen strife in a home that you, you knew you loved each other and there was strife in that home? Oh, I'm, y'all are angels. Let me tell you, it does happen. Y'all are so angelic. Here's what you do you, you head out that you, you identify the severe of strife and you say, Strife, guess what? I've been given a name above every name. The blood of Jesus is, has cleansed me, and I'm the righteousness of God. And you will bow your knee. Jesus astonished them because the kingdom was with him, and everywhere he went, he had authority. They said, man, that's not like any teaching we ever saw. That has authority. If we are going to present the United States of America and the world, the church, I'm not talking about this local congregation. I'm talking about the church, the real church of Jesus Christ. We've got to have the real goods. And when they're on the ear saying, all the talking heads are saying, well, I don't know what the answer is. How do you get inside the criminal mind? Blah, 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 blah. And after an hour, they have zero answer. Zero, yeah. zero, zero. And it's heartbreaking. And so you just want to say, doesn't anybody remember a time we turned to God? Don't you know about the first great awakening and the second great awakening? Don't you know about Cambridge camp meeting in, in um, 1802? I, some of you probably don't even know about it, but God came to Kentucky. And it was so magnificent. They called them communion. This is boring you. No. I'm tired of America getting trounced by the devil. And yeah. this place was founded about to be a city set on a hill. This place was to be a living demonstration of the kingdom. And so many times we've turned to him and seen his glory. And yet here we are and nobody's saying. It's, it. Come on. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm going to talk about Cambridge real fast. Just what happened. There wasn't much, you know, any time that you're not seeking God, you know what you do? You backslide. You get, oh, you're all just, just oh, angels. I wish there would be some people that were not angels. How many of you have ever gotten cold because you weren't pushing toward God? Okay, you don't push toward God. Okay, so the church had gotten cold. They had things called, uh, their revival was called a communion service. And they get together with the, all the denominations and they hold these big communion services out. They bring covered wagons because <coughs> Big, um, what do you call circle and fire, and then they take communion together, and God had come. Sometimes they'd have 25,000 people 
in a, in a county in Kentucky that wouldn't have 2,000 lived there. People came from everywhere because they were so hungry for God. Have you ever read the accounts? There's eyewitness accounts. They would have stumps for pulpits, and they'd have up to 20 different preachers all preaching their heart out at once. And the conviction would come upon the crowd to the point where women and men would be groaning before God, repenting of their sins, and God would come down. And you say, well, it can't happen again. Look, at some point, we're going to figure out that the idols that we have worshipped, our sunum bonum isn't the sunum bonum of the universe. There's a higher good. Yeah. There is a higher good. And his name is Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So anyhow, I'm going to preach a nice, calm lesson today. There's all kinds of verses that say we receive the kingdom. I've got like one after another. Let's look at one, one scripture to close. Luke 20. We don't read this very often because we think it applied to the Jews of Jesus' day. Luke chapter 20. We're going to start at verse 9. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and rented it out to the vine growers, and he went away on the journey for a long time. Okay, the man is the Lord, the vineyard is the world. At the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine grower so that he would give them some of the produce of the vineyard. The vine growers beat him and sent him away empty handed. Who does that represent? The prophets that the Lord sent? Are we going to have some worship back for all my investment? And they said, no, nope, they killed the prophets. Come on. Verse 11, he proceeded to send another slave, and they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send a third, and this one also they wounded and cast out. And the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Maybe they'll respect him. But when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another, saying, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. And I heard Brother Copeland say this years ago, and I just I couldn't think of anything else for 20 minutes. He said they killed the heir when God was already going to sacrifice him so that everything he had would be heirs. We are heirs of the kingdom. And you say, why are you, know, why are you? because if we just sit here and hold on tight to our ticket to heaven and never let America know, I mean, there is a world out there saying, I can't send my baby to a movie theater. We thought that was a safe place. I mean, isn't the entertainment the best part of your month? Uh-oh. Come on. Let's finish it. Verse 14. When the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another, saying, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard. <coughs> and then what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy those wine growers and will give the vineyard to others. When they heard it, they said, oh, may it never be. You know, part of what I had to share with you this morning is just a prophetic call to come back to God. And I'm not saying we're far from God. We're the ones in church on a beautiful July Sunday morning. I understand that. But it is time for the church of Jesus Christ to raise up the standard and what they're saying. Where are the answers? And psychology said, I don't uh, have them. And, yeah. and legislation said, I don't have them. And we're all grieving for the America. I told, I just, I was so upset. On Friday, was it Friday they got the news? I, was, I told Nathan, part of my heart is broken for 70 people that were wounded. The rest of my heart is broken for an America I can never give you in Christianity. Because we're all going to be perfect, but men, if you were divorced, I'll tell you right now, I only knew one lady that was divorced once, a kid grew up in Ohio. It was, I'm not saying there's shame if you're divorced, the blood of Jesus will, but it, our society has changed to where anything goes. And entertainment is the best part of our month. If entertainment is the best part of your month, you need to get on your face before God and say, God, I forgot who you were. I forgot that I'd be the devil's hell without you, Lord Jesus. I forgot that you loved me as much as all the people in the world put together. You would die for me. Thank you. And it is time that we rise up and tell the world there is an answer. And there is a coming kingdom that is going to make your stupid 
I'm sorry. I don't like that man. I've never seen him, so I couldn't say. But please understand me. I don't care all the Star Wars trilogies or quadrants, whatever many there are. I don't care. They are not reality. Yeah. This young man, I mean, I'm a news junkie. I don't watch TV except for the news. A young man being interviewed. He and his girlfriend and their two kids got out. They said, what'd you do? He said, I proposed to my wife. Or to my girlfriend. Isn't that funny? He knew what the right thing was to do. All this time he said I went the right thing. And then all this time he knew the right thing to do. Isn't that amazing? Now I'm telling you, the idols of America are falling. Amen. One by one, as gently and graciously as God can take them down. He wow. loves us. Yeah. But he can't let this whole nation just slide into eternity without Jesus. And you know, Come on. Come on. The things, a lot of things I say, you know, they're not popular. You're not supposed to tell people they need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, but you know that's what Jesus said. And there's nowhere in the Bible that said it went away. It does say in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, do not forbid to speak in tongues. So we're scriptural around here. We don't forbid to speak in tongues. It is very unpopular. You see, I said that when I was growing up, I knew one lady that was divorced. I didn't know anybody that lived together. When I first heard of it, and see, you don't just say that in American church. Come on. You have to pretend Preach it's okay. It. Preach it. But let me tell you something. When he was faced with his mortality, the first thing he did was propose to his girlfriend. I didn't tell him that. Did you tell him that? Who told him that? His conscience. It's written on his heart. It says in Romans 1 that the, 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 the very law of God is written on our heart. And it's time for us to hold up a kingdom, a coming kingdom that is so close. You say it's way off. Oh, in the light of eternity, it's not an hour away. It's not 15 minutes away. And they have so little time. And it's time for you and me to start living like these kids saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's so close. You can reach out and grab it. And if you don't, it will be too late because it will be here. Mm -hmm. And it's time. I'm telling you, the Lord really wants me to make a call for repentance. And you don't have to come down here, but you know your heart. If the highest good of your month are the two movies you get to go to see, there's a problem there. Yeah. Yes. Because if, if, a, if, a, if a killer does come into that theater, you can call out to every hero on that screen. They not be real, honey. I'm sorry, but this is not reality. This may be your alternative reality. I thought, you know, those, a lot of those people in that theater had, a, had an alternative reality. This wasn't as evil as the gunman's alternative reality. They thought that this was as good as it gets. Only Jesus Christ has that face. Yeah. Only Jesus loves you like that. Yeah. And if you, yeah. you say, what do you want from me? I want you. Yeah. I'm trying to get there. I want us as a congregation yeah. to just tell God, being in your presence is what I look for. Yeah. When I get to heaven, I'm not going to look for grandma first, although I really look forward to seeing my grandma again. I'm not going to look for my husband who went on. The first one, the first one, one of the, like that old song, first person I want to see is Jesus. Amen. And I want to see him again. And if I get away from him, I want to see him again. <coughs> Do you know why? Because there's a lot of people, and we love each other very much, not one of us loves you like Jesus. Amen. And it's time for us to tell God we will never have the idols of this society high lifted up. You say, oh, you're saying we can't go see movies. No, this is not a legalistic church. I'm not telling you you can't wear makeup with it. You can't go see movies. But please understand that when push comes to show up, shove, I mean, yeah. a lot of those women, the worst problem they have is a bad hair day. And they went into that theater worrying about a bad hair day. We don't like bad hair days, do we? But it don't matter very much on that day. Wow. And it's time for us to hold up the gospel yes. and the truth. You know, I think we should sing His Glory Appears instead of the song. We have a planned music team if you come. And we won't have a formal dismissal, but I encourage you to spend five minutes before God saying, Oh God, if there's idols in my heart, I'm so sorry. And I want you to know that you're the highest good that I have ever known. And I worship you today. And I worship you.